welcome everyone. My name is Xander Sprague and I'm your host for Epic Begins with One Step Forward. And today we are having an epic conversation with Kelly Preen. What? Who? Whoa. That's happening. Let's do this. <laughs> Absolutely. So just to give you a little background, I've known Kelly for well, more years than Kelly and I are actually going to admit, but we know each other from, from, from college. And I went to Pitzer College. Kelly went to Pomona. And Kelly is a force. And I... When we went to school, even though we went to different schools, all the schools are right there next to each other. So as much time as I spent at Pomona, I spent at, at Pitzer doing Without a Box, hanging out with a bunch of my Pitzer friends. There's an all-women's college called Scripps that I was trying to spend time at. <laughs> you know, I really didn't come into my own until after college. But yeah, man, the, the, our college experience was, it was fantastic. And we got to know each other. And it, it has been a, in a minute. But we're looking, we're holding up. We're looking good, I like to think. I, I'd like to, I'd like to believe that. I, I gotta say that if I got carted and go to go in a bar and they say, sorry, you can't come in, I'd actually believe that because I myself have a hard time believing the number that's actually attached to me right now. Yeah, yeah, I know it. I know it. And I know you're rocking the dome. I love it. Usually I do too, but this is my, I've been letting it go since the uh, pandemic. So I call this my stay at Frome. <laughs> it's good. I'm going to try to let it go. I can't lie to you. There, Every other day, I'm like, I got to cut it. It looks like I got buckwheat in a headlock, and I, but I'm going to try to keep it. I'm, I'm going to try to go with it. I'm going to use it for a, a character or you know, something because it, it takes seconds to cut and months to grow. So it you does. Know, I'll probably look like you very soon when I get my next job. It, 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 it is looking good. Oh, not right. sure. I'll take that. Oh, not sure. So, Kelly, just – maybe share with our listeners just kind of a brief history of who is Kelly Preen and what's your career been? Because it's... Uh, how, how far back do you want me to go? Look, I'll give you just a quick, you know, quick background of like... Yeah, yeah. I'm originally from, you know, Pennsylvania, State College. My dad taught at Penn State. And so my dad was a professor of adolescent psychology, but he also did musical theater. So I have been on the stage acting, singing, uh, dancing, doing all that since, since I was four, since I was five. But it was, I wasn't here in Hollywood. I was here there in Pennsylvania. So it wasn't what, like I was a Hollywood ki kid chasing Hollywood dreams. I was a central Pennsylvania kid. Doing, <laughs> doing community theater and community happy for it. Theater with 27 old people in there. And, but it was, I, what did I know? It, it, it was awesome. And I knew very young that I loved the attention, both positive and negative. And if I couldn't get it positive, <laughs> I feel you. But that's the beautiful thing about the theater. You, you get that immediate reaction, you get that, uh, that feedback, you get that attention, and I always liked the interaction. I was a class clown. I wasn't like bad in school in that I was stabbing kids in the bathroom, but I was talkative. I like, I like to be the, the focus of attention, and so I grew up doing a lot of theater. Went to high school outside of Chicago, where I continued to do theater. Went to a place called Lake Forest Academy. Yeah. And so in my senior year, my parents had moved to San Diego. When I was looking at colleges, I was looking at schools all in California. So I looked at the Claremont Colleges, looked at Pitzer, looked at Pomona, looked at Stanford, looked at a number of different schools. But when I got into Pomona, I'm like, all right, that's it. Yeah. Here we go. And so it, it, going to Pomona was fantastic because what it, what it did was it was small enough for me to get around and get to know everybody. Because where I went to high school, I was one of 72 in my graduating class. We had... 10 kids, 14 kids in a class. And I remember my freshman year at Pomona, there was like 70 kids in a physics class. And I'm like, what the, what the hell are you all? Get out of the room. <laughs> Can't learn with this many God, get out. And I also remember I came from Chicago and, you know, went to boarding school, shirt and tie every day. Oh yeah, same, I, sa same thing. So I, I came to California, one. went to school and people were like in flip flops and shorts. I'm like, you can't. You can't learn in flip flops. Go put on some, go put on some, some penny loafers, goddamn. But so by the second year, I'm in a tank top, I'm in flip flops, I got my Birkenstocks. <laughs> it takes no time uh, at all to get uh, acquainted with the California weather and the California, for your lifestyle. But coming here to California to Pomona, I started doing a lot of improv comedy, and I was in a troupe called Without a Box, which I was one of the founding members. Yeah, I got a funny and, story uh, about that. Yeah, no, we had a great time doing improv. And that's just where I just became uh, aware and felt comfortable enough to take strong chances 
in theater and in life, because in, in improv, you, there's, a, there's a saying you say, yes, and. You never deny, you always heighten it. You take it to the next thing. So, yeah. so you have to listen very intently to see what the person you're interacting with is saying, and you have to add on to it. And you can't be timid, you can't be shy. And that really, that improv training helped me greatly as I started to also develop as an actor who had to make strong choices, who had to read the script, who had to break down text and, and come up with what I thought was the character's angle, the, the, the character's take. Yeah. and go for it. I believe in acting that there's really no, there's no bad choices. I think there are weak choices. There's unjustified choices. But if you study the text and you get the material and you can justify the choice you make and do it full force, it might not be the direction, say, the director wanted to go with that, but he'll, he'll redirect you to what it is. And it'll show both that you how to be directed and also that you know how to take initiative. And so as we start talking about the whole concept of epic and being epic and going after things, the, the ability to take the initiative to start when everybody tells you not to start to, you know, it'll never happen. You'll never make it. You, you have to find a way. And I'll jump around a lot about different philosophies and things, but you, you have to find a way to let those voices that tell you can't do something or shouldn't do something or shouldn't uh, audition for the play because you're only a freshman or you shouldn't take that leap of faith because no one else has done it. You got to silence those voices and you got to get rid of the friends and the people that are those voices. You got to love them, but you got to surround yourself by the other voices, the other folks that say, let's try, you know, let's, let's, let's go after it. Oh, absolutely. And you were talking about without a box, which was fabulous. And I actually auditioned for without a box. Oh yeah. But, and here, this is a funny story. I had all of the luck as I got up there to do improv. Who was my improv partner? But Max Brooks, the son oh, of- yeah. Mel Brooks' son, Max Brooks. Yeah, so that's kind so, of- So, I don't know. I, 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 I got the feeling after that, not as successful uh, audition, that perhaps- there is a comedy gene and that it is passed from generation to generation because well, you know, Max maybe, was so. brilliant, so funny, but oh my God, like he was, I, he was I, at 78 know, and I was going at 33. Yeah, yeah. I think he was, a, he was a freshman or something when I was a senior, so I really didn't yeah. get a chance to interact with him too much, but I don't know if necessarily there's a comedy gene. There can be, same way as we see a lot of actors come in who have a family lineage. I do believe though, that if you're from a family that you watch, again, your parents make strong choices, take criticism and let it roll off of them. Some jokes land, some jokes don't, but you come back in with your next one. If you are raised that way over and over again, the, there's a sense of, again, fearlessness that whatever you do, whatever joke you put out there, is that they, they, they can't kill me. <laughs> the joke bombed, but so the what? They can't kill me for yeah. having a bad performance, for not telling a good joke, for having a bad set, for having a bad show. So that, no matter where that gene comes from, whether or not it's passed down from your father, who is Mel Brooks, <laughs> or just from a, a coach that w believed in you, a teacher that believed in you, wherever that gene that you believe in yourself comes from, I, I believe it's mandatory to have. And I think that if you look at through lines of people that are successful, some people become successful at 25, some people become successful at 70. At some point, they acquire that gene that says, it, I'm going after it, and no is not an option. So wherever you get it from, be it your parents, be it from yourself, you can be born with that confidence. You have to have it. You, you have to get it. I don't beg, borrow, or steal, but become confident and believe in yourself. I don't know how you can go to therapy. I mean, I guess I, here I am launching a, a speaking career during a pandemic. So yeah, yeah, you have no right to do that. Why did you, why did you call me? The thing, oh, you know, you the thing, the thing I want to do is fill a room with people and I can't do it because <laughs> we're not allowed to do it. But Again, not stopping me. And I do think there's a lot of truth in what you're saying that those, some of that is just being comfortable like in front of a crowd. I know I love nothing more than getting up in front of people and doing a speech, doing a performance. Yeah. Like you, 
I love the attention. I crave the attention. I'm, I've often said that my biggest high I, is when I get to speak in front of people. Yeah. And that audience interaction, one of the most challenging parts of what I'm doing is yeah, I've done podcasts and stuff. When I'm just speaking into a mic, it is so much harder, even though I can speak really well, because I don't have the audience to, to play off of. Now, I know that, that Kelly, you've been uh, a very successful uh, actor on, in movies and, and on TV. And here's a question for you. When you're, when you're in a production TV or, or movie, are you playing off of the crew? Because they obviously have to be quiet, but if you're doing something that's funny, you a lot of my career has been doing sitcoms i, I can talk about some dramatic stuff later but right. i'll focus on some of the sitcom stuff so sure. a lot of people have been looking at me like okay how do i know him i got my first and i work up to your answer by telling you that that's my fun story. my first a, out of college i went to university of california irvine and i got a master's in drama so i mm -hmm. went and i studied my craft and i think that's part of people's success and epic journey is that you become a craftsman at your trade. And, and I don't look at my career or my cr trade as a hobby that right. I lucked into. I look at it as my vocation. I could have been a doctor if I wanted to, I didn't want to, I wanted to do this. So I got myself as good as I could be at that. Right. We'll talk about comedy, but I also did improv. But then when I got out of college, I tried stand up. And you talk about talking on the mic yeah. Uh, being around you talk but stand up you're dealing with the crowd but you're pretty much it's you oh it's, there's no doubt i've done stand up too and it is woo, crickets let me tell you crickets man and it, even in improv you're like hey uh, give me a location give me a relationship in stand up it's just you like hey, hey who's uh, been on a plane before yeah no one in this room so <laughs> yeah you're up there by yourself and sure you feed off of the energy uh, of the crowd, but you better have your material. You better have your chops. And again, stand-up comedy is a vocation. And I was great at improv. I did stand-up, not because I wanted to be a stand-up comedian, uh, but because I thought that's how they were handing comedians their shows. Yeah. And to some degree, they still do see comedians as a fast track to a, to a television sitcom deal, because what a comedian has to do is he has to let you know very quickly what their perspective is. I'm a short Jewish woman who grew up in New York. And so that lets you know what you're allowed to laugh at right. when they, hey, I'm a this short black kid from central Pennsylvania who was picked, whatever. They can now laugh at whatever stories that you tell. But again, that's about perspective. And so when we talk about playing off the crowd, stand up wasn't necessarily my thing. I didn't want to spend every night at comedy clubs for five hours a night, which I believe you would have to do if that's your vocation and that's how you wanted to succeed at it. Oh, absolutely. I did not want to be a stand-up. I want to be an actor. So I focused my uh, attention on getting more acting gigs, doing plays, doing showcases, that type of thing. So I got my first big break of two lines on the Drew Carey show. So I came in to play a, a process server who serves Drew a, uh, a subpoena because he's been, he's in a sexual assault claim right um there the, the episode was he put up a uh, cartoon of a caterpillar making love to a crinkly cut french fry uh. and some of the women thought that it was in the office and so they sued drew and i was a process server so i came in i did two lines that was my job my job was to hit my mark my yeah. job was to lay down the bunt my job was to move the runners and then go back into the dugout yeah that, that was my job but I was on time, I knew my lines, I was friendly. You didn't have to bang on the trailer door to get me out. And it was fantastic. And you talk about sitcoms, live studio audiences, that's the opportunity where you do have a chance to play off of the, the producers are laughing and the crew can laugh and right. people can laugh. And then, and then if it's live, the audience laughs. So you feed off of that energy. And a lot of things have been moving away from live studio audiences. Now with COVID, you can't really have the studios now. But in the back in the day, I did a number of shows that were shot in front of a live studio audience. And you definitely do feed off the crowd feed off of the, the gaffers, the, the production team, the producers, right. the writers, they're, they're all allowed to laugh. And a lot of times if they're not laughing, 
<laughs> there's, there's something wrong. Yeah, no doubt. If they're not laughing, then you see them huddle in the side. And then they look at you. Then they go back. You're like, oh, fuck. <laughs> what did I do? So, so in terms of a part of an epic story, those two lines became four lines. They brought me back as, hey, let's bring him back as Chuck the security guard. So I was Chuck the security guard, and two episodes became four episodes. Four lines became eight. It became, I'm now in 14, 15 shows per season. Uh, I get to know the cast. I get to, I go with Drew and the crew when they go to Vegas and we still, so that's a small, epic little stair step story. That's awesome. You know, about trying to answer your question about whether or not you can feed off of the, the energy. Cause even if it's a comedy or it's like I say, it's a single camera and they can't laugh, you can tell if the energy is excited and they want to laugh. Because a lot of times after they say cut, they just start cracking up. Because they, they can't laugh just for audio reasons, because there's other stuff they have to do. It's not like a studio audience where they're going to dub in and even sweeten the laughs. Yeah. They have to be quiet so that the sound mixer can do his thing later. But right. you can feed off of the energy. There's In every performance space, and I'm sure you can speak to it too, in every performance platform, there's an energy, a collective energy of the actors you're working with, the crew, the directors, everybody. And I've been lucky enough to have most of the experiences that I've been part of. The energy is nothing but positive and, and supportive. Absolutely. And I, I want to let people know that through the years, I'll be watching TV and all of a sudden there's Kelly and be it on, I was, I, I told Kelly this story last week, which was, I was, I've been rewatching ER and all of a sudden there's Kelly as a med student. And I was like, oh my God, there's Kelly. And it's, I have to say for me, super cool to say there's someone I know and not just, oh, Kelly went to Pomona and I knew who he was. Uh, obviously Kelly knows who I am. If I ran into Kelly on the street, he wouldn't be like, you, you went to Pitzer? Uh, oh, okay. Yeah. You know. I'm sure we partied together once or twice, Z. Yeah. Yeah. We probably, yeah, we were in some of the same parties. We, we knew each other. We did. No, absolutely. And it's, it is really cool to see, see people that, that you know, and see the success that they're having. And Kelly, I know, again, from, as you said, two lines became 12 episodes, 14 episodes. And from there, you, and that is the way that my understanding that in like acting careers begin. I've been watching, I love MASH, like re-watching MASH. And the number of people that were on there that we look at now and go, oh my gosh, there's- there, Yeah, there's- Ron, I mean, I, I, there, there, There's Ron Howard, there's- And how people like, like, like you played one part and then they brought him back. So for example, yeah. Harry Morgan, who played Sherman Potter, was in like season one played like this crazy general who was like old and losing his mind. And then they bring him back a couple seasons later to be one of the main cast members. So that's you know, really funny. Yeah, and there's a couple things that you touched on there that I'll try to weave in. The, I've been in this career now 26 years, not necessarily to age myself. And I've done, started with Drew Carey show. Then I did a show for a good long time called One-on-One, uh, -on -one, where I played Dwayne Odell Knotts. Did that for about four years. Before that, I did a show called Between Brothers with me and Tommy Davidson, Kadeem Hardison. Yeah. Uh, that only lasts a season. I did that. Did the Parenthood. Then I did everything from ER, Mad About You, Seinfeld, Living Single, Providence. I just got off a show uh, on Nickelodeon called Night Squad. So depending on what color you are, what age you are, what, you yeah. know, black people know me from one-on-one -on -one and between brothers. Yeah. So, some white folks know me from Drew Carey show and, and Seinfeld. Yeah. Uh, a, lot of, a, lot of, a lot of parents know me from Night Squad and a lot of the stuff I did on Disney. And I'm like, look. I, or I, Santa I, Hunter. I'm, you glad know? You, I'm glad you're right. And after all that time, after 26 years, I'm still what I call a that guy. Yeah. Um, because if you look at me, you're like, hey, well, how do I? I know that guy, but I don't know exactly what I know him from, like I said. And so I'll be walking past people and I can see them look and I can see them do a double take and go, was that? Because I can't quite put it together where they know me from. And if they do stop me, they're like, how, how do I know? Do you go to my church? Do you owe me $7? How do I know you? And so I'll go Drew Carey show, one-on-one, -on -one, no. Between Brothers, no. That one Seinfeld episode, yes, yes! 
And so you talk about me, I am blessed. I had a 26 year career in Hollywood, but most of the people that you are talking to or seeing this probably don't know my name. And that's fantastic. That's okay. Cause I've lived a fantastic, I've done, I'm not planning on dying shit. <laughs> I ain't done Zen. Don't die yet. I, I only, I think I'm only halfway through what is a, you know, fabulous career. And, and again, I didn't set out for it to be epic per se, but I did, you know, set out for it to be continual and continuous. Yeah. Uh, and I set out for it to be my vocation. And when I say I've worked nonstop for, for 26 years, or this is how I've been making my career, I believe that's by design and not by accident. And the crazy thing about my industry is it's one of the, it's a confluence of two things. It's a confluence of one, it's the most glamorous, one of the most glamorous industries in the world. The Oscars, the Emmys, the Tonys, beautiful with pages of your people are getting paid, Us Magazine, but it's very glamorous. And you don't need any credentials whatsoever to call yourself a professional. That is true. So if you have those two things, it's amazing and that and that, and you don't got to do to call yourself a professional, sign me up. And so yeah. every you know month, there's another thousand, two thousand people coming into Hollywood. There's 30,000 people right now with their Screen Actors Guild cards. There's a lot. Of, I'll tell you a story. Right out of school, I went on a, an audition. And uh, in school, I went to a couple of situations where I was like one of the one and few black kids there. And hopefully yeah. I was standing out and without a box and everything. So I was, and then I went to grad school and in grad school, you get parts, you get stuff. So you're used to getting jobs and getting work. And so I went to an audition like two or three weeks after I got out of college, I got a, you know, agent. And I walked into a room and there was 45 to 60 five foot six chubby black kids who <laughs> look just, and I looked around and go, what if it, this is, and that was just for the morning session. <laughs> In the afternoon, there's going to be another 60 short chubby black comedians again. And you look around and go, oh, I saw him on Fresh Prince. Oh, I saw him on the, oh, I said that. Yeah. Oh. And so when you become someone who's jumped into the big pond, you have to decide, or I decided very quickly that, okay, I'm going to have to find out what makes me unique. Yeah. Why it is I believe I should su succeed? What is my plan for success? Is it to audition my way to get, or is it for me to create my own work, for me to write my own stuff? What route am I going to take? Uh, again, I don't see acting as different than any other vocation in that you, I'm putting together a plan for my success. And I think that a lot of folks, unfortunately, when they come into Hollywood, one, they don't know what the actor's work is. So they don't know what to do with their nine to five brain. Right. Um, I put eight hours a day into my vocation, into my career, because that's just the way I was raised. Like I said, I was raised in central Pennsylvania and I have a, a nine to five, eight hour a day work ethic. Sure. And it's funny. I went to school with kids who did chores before they went to school, came home, did more chores, did homework, and then went to bed so they could get up and do it again. So that's, that's hard work. For, oh, I'm like, absolutely. God damn, look at it. So when I go to Starbucks or talk to my friend, there's people, oh, I had to write for two hours. <laughs> Get the f*** out of here. What did you do with the other six hours of your eight-hour day? Yeah. What? Yeah, what, what did you do? What is your plan? What are your eight hours you put in? Because if you're an actor, if you're a writer, if you're a producer, if you're an entrepreneur, if you're someone whose livelihood is based on you doing you, what are you doing for eight hours to make sure that your business succeeds? And if you're sitting around waiting for the phone to, uh, to ring, if you're sitting around waiting for your agent to call, if you're sitting around waiting for Hollywood to discover you, if you sit around waiting for entrepreneurial chances to come, if you're not knocking on doors, if you're not going to the gym to stay in shape, if you're not reading the trades, if you're not doing whatever it is you need to do to get better at your craft, then you're wasting your time. You're taking food out of your mouth and money out of your pocket. Uh, abs uh, ab absolutely. And, and I'm a firm believer, Kelly, that it is, <laughs> if you have a plan, I'm, I am, I'm structure boy. Okay, I can, if I have a plan and I know that I'm talking to, to Kelly at 11 a.m. and after that I'm going to go edit this video or I'm going to work on my book or I'm going to do whatever, right? It, it's so much easier to do because you have your roadmap. Hey, right. I know what I need to do today. If you get up and go, um, oh my God, I've got to read the trades, I've got to write on, I got to spend two, I got to 
work on my tra- my script. I got to do this. Oftentimes people, there's so many things that they want to try and do that they get nothing done because they just get stuck. And, and again, and that's part of, it, it's funny. When, when we all go to school, we all went to high school or gra- you know, growing up, elementary, middle school, yep. high school, we were given by our teachers, by the school, our syllabus. Here's what you do. Here's what you read. Here's when it's do- due by. Here's when you need the paper. Here's where the test going to come. When you are thrown out into the real world, it is your job to set your own syllabus. It's your job to set your own curriculum. It's your job to set your own eight hours. And there's beauty in that because you have the freedom to say, I'm an actor, right? So I say going to the gym for an hour and a half is part of my eight hour work. Oh, absolutely. Going to see Tenet, if I want to, is part of that eight hours because I want to see the movies. Watching the, these, the new six or seven television shows is part of my eight hours. Getting to network is part of my going to parties where I get free wine and food, going to a film festival. There's amazing, great things that fall under what I have to do to be good at my craft. And that's awesome. It's not all. No, it's no, absolutely not. And then, but it's also, but it's also not only when I'm on the set, that's the cherry. That's the icing on the cake. When I'm on the set, that's part of the eight hours too, but I'm using the eight hours before I get the job, before my manager called and says, yes, you're booked. I'm using those hours every day to get those jobs. Oh, absolutely. And I think epic success comes from having a plan following it as best you can, and also defining what is part of your job. And you're absolutely right. Exercise is, that's that's part of my own self-care. So absolutely. My saying, I didn't sleep well, so I I slept in, but I'm going to go do my workout at noon. Oh, why are you doing that? Uh, Because I'm I'm my own boss. Yeah, and here's the beautiful thing of it. 24 hours is a lot of time. That's a load of time. So if you sleep for eight hours, you got 16 hours left. You put in your eight, doing whatever, going to the gym, doing your writing, doing your work, dinner, then you have eight hours to do whatever you want with. Yeah. That's a lot of time. And, and oftentimes you find that your eight hours is not necessarily nine to five because you may get you might get to noon and be like man the motivation is gone right now so i'm gonna go take a walk i'm gonna go to the beach whatever whatever. you come back and say it's 6 p.m now had a great afternoon and now i'm gonna sit now i feel like i can sit down and do what i want to do and look you're an adult you look Eat a hamburger for breakfast, God damn it. You can do whatever you want. Absolutely. No, you can, absolutely. You can and, eat however you want. I was talking to somebody the other day, and I, I thought about this. I go, I love being an adult. People are like, oh, I wish I want to go back when I had no responsibilities and mom and dad were paying. I'm like, for that. I like being able to do what I want to do when I want to do it. Obviously, if I'm on a show and I have to t- have a call time and do all that, obviously. And again, I do try to pride myself on, on being professional, on being on time. I'm a believer if you're, and I'm black, goddammit, I'm not trying to be on time. <laughs> you know, I'm a believer if you can't be on time, be early. I'm a believer in being becoming overprepared and then let it go. That's where some of the improv is, just let it go. Yeah. Uh, I'm, a believer in, I'm a believer in being a problem solver. I think you'll find in whatever vocation you are, and if someone's watching an, an office, or whatever, you can think right now who the problem makers are in your office, in your life, uh, in your surroundings, because there are always people that are setting fires, always people that are making problems, always people that are expanding the amount of discord and chaos. Your job as a professional, if you, even if you're working for yourself or whoever, your job is to be a problem solver. So. Part of the reason why I think I've done well in Hollywood is that when I, when my job is to, you know, go on set, be on time, whether I'm a secret series regular or a have two or three lines, is to be a problem solver. So I'll say to the first AD, look, my trailer's right there. I have my costume on. I know my lines. Uh, when you're ready for me, just come and get me. I'll you not only have to knock once. I'll come right out of the trailer. <laughs> I'll come right out, hit my mark and get out of people's way, <laughs> yeah. you know? Cause you hear so many stories of, oh yeah, he wouldn't come out of his trailer, he wouldn't. I'm like, mm, for me, mm-mm. as long as that check cleared, I'm gonna be right out the trailer. 
Absolutely. No, ab ab absolutely. And, and, and I think it, it takes so long to build a reputation and two seconds to blow it. Yeah. And as in, to go back to your story, if there's, if you're a problem, if you're a pain in the butt, there's 60 other, and I'm using your words, so I'm not using your own <laughs> words, ch five, five foot six chubby black man. Yeah, I do, I do yoga now, so I'm a little, sli I'm a little, sli no, 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 but I do do yoga, but go so, on. But there's 50 other similar looking dudes more than happy to come take your place and hit their mark and show up right. on time. Yeah. And obviously, like any business, Hollywood is the entertainment industry. There's a lot of networking and there's sure. talk between ADs and directors and producers and stuff like that. When you get the reputation, as I know you do, of being a, the consummate professional, being on time, hitting your mark, whatever, you're the one who, as they're talking about it, if your name comes up, they go, oh, yeah, yeah no, he, he's good. He's a he'll. Yeah. And, and the thing people have to remember for not only Hollywood, my business, but also their, their, their industries, time really is money. And directors, uh, producer, production companies that working with the same people because they know their time and money is not going to be wasted. And, and I found that if there's a problem, if there's somebody who's wasting people's time or whatever, a lot of times it comes out of insecurity on that person. So part of the reason I went to, to graduate school and got a degree in acting is not because the industry says, you have to have a master's degree and it, it, my master's degree doesn't mean to my industry. Me being good, me knowing that I'm good, me not having any hit games about what it is I can do yeah. is what pays off and what I went and got my, you know, degree for. Absolutely. Um, and again, I also said earlier, and I will repeat it again, you have to become good and excellent at your trade. And as you do that, the anxiety that makes you go, oh, I'm gonna get found out, I'm gonna get found out. And a lot of people that are scared of being found out are the people that are problem makers because they're trying to misdirect and cross. I'm like, I'm trying to be like Zen. I'm like, I'm here, baby. I know, I've studied my lines. I know right. what I'm doing. Right. I'll make a strong choice. If the director doesn't like it, he'll have me do something else. Yeah, one of, one of the things that I, I talk about to people, whether I'm, I'm giving a speech or I'm doing coaching or mental health counseling or, or whatever, it's oftentimes people's roadblocks, the things that I hear of why they can't do something are actually a mirage. Oh, I can't do this because of this. And they aren't actually, the roadblocks are, you're putting them in front of yourself. They aren't actually there. Yeah, I'm, I'm with you. Here's something that I think about. It's funny, to be an actor, to be a creative artist, is to, in some ways, sign up for uncertainty, insecurity, be, being comfortable with being uncomfortable, because there are stretches where I'm not working, where I'm not, because I'm trying to get work and doing all that. So I tell people, if, if you want comfort and stability, this is not the, the industry to get into, per se. But I also go, with some of the anxieties, I go, listen, they want you to be good. Everybody, when you walk into the room for an audition, is scared. The casting director is scared that they won't bring in the right people and they never get hired again. The right. director is worried that the piece is going to be crappy. The writer is worried because there's not going to jump off the page. The production company is worried because their last three shows were a flop. And so I got to go, ah. So I walk in there and go, my job is for all of you to know that when I walk out of the room, your shoulders are going to go, Oh, okay, at least we know we have a choice for that part. Yeah. And oh, so when you, and yeah. when you remember that people want you to be good and you're allowed to be good and you've trained and prepared to be good, your anxiety and your shoulders can come down a little bit, I think. Yeah. And I know that as a motivational speaker and stuff, my message is going to resonate with my audience wonderfully. There are the people who may hear me speak, may watch this and think, I'm not their cup of tea. You want to know it? That's fine. I, I don't need to worry about those people. I need to, to play to the audience that wants to hear me. Yeah, yeah. And, here's, and the beautiful thing is that if they listen to you, if they listen to this, this hour or whatever it's going to be, and they go, ah, that's not necessarily his philosophies in mind, but maybe you take one thing away 
You take one thing away from it. That's pretty good. Or if the takeaway is that what we're talking about or what I'm saying is not what they want to do, that's a takeaway because then you then won't, if you recognize a philosophy that is like ours, you'll steer clear of it and spend your time doing something else. So that's a takeaway. So right. if you, I'm into exponential growth. Um, I have a concept called double the penny because if you take a penny and you double it every day, a penny to two cents, two yeah. cents to four cents, four. Right. within 30 moves, you're at a million dollars. Yeah. 30. So what I do in my career is I'm just trying to, wherever I'm at, I'm trying to double whatever. I'm trying to double a penny. Uh, I'm trying to take this 16 cents and make it 32. I'm trying to make this hundred thousand dollar project and knock it out of the park. So I get my $200,000 project because right. in another two moves, I'll have my million dollar project. I think a lot of folks, and I'll give you this analogy, are, you know, get anxiety because their time frames, I think, are out of whack. They expect to succeed too quickly. Yeah. And I give this analogy. I go, if I was a senior in, in college and a freshman walked in crying, <laughs> I go, well, what's wrong? Well, <laughs> I was away from home for the first time. I got all A's. It was hard to be adjusted, but I did really well. And they're not going to let me graduate. <laughs> but you're a freshman. I know. I know. But I did well. And I did this. And I did this. Idiot, you're a freshman. And you use the goals in the front of freshman year in order to put yourself in great position for sophomore year. Yeah. And you do that in order to put yourself in position to get together for a great junior year. So that right. you can go to senior year and graduate summa cum laude, magna cum laude. You're not going to succeed after you're not going to graduate after your freshman year. And when you understand that and take that pressure off of you, Go to, you go to the football games and you'll go see some plays and you go do some other stuff and you'll do freshmen during your freshman year. Uh, yeah, absolutely. And uh, there's, a, I think it was uh, Zig Ziglar, who's pretty famous motivational yeah. speaker. Like and I, I can't say for sure, but it was like one of these, like most people know who, who the speaker is. I think it was Zig who said, I was a seven year overnight success. Oh yeah. And I totally get that. And, and you look, at, you look at, at the acting community and the people that, that we go, oh, wow, that person's really great. And then you go back, because we have IMDb, so we can go back. And, and then you see the 25 shows that that person did where yep. maybe they were an extra. Yep. Maybe, they, maybe they had one line, but frankly, it wasn't particularly mem memorable. You, you, yeah, w whatever it is, whatever philosophy you want to put into it, you don't become a partner at a law firm overnight. There's no, no lawyer that's going to graduate from law school and within two, unless their their dad's name is on <laughs> the thing, within a year, be a partner. That's not how it works. And, that, and that's okay. When you allow yourself the time it takes to mature and grow, again, it, it, it relieves the stress. It gives you the time to become great. I think a lot of times you, you see a lot of actors who maybe get opportunities that they're ill-prepared for. Oh, gosh, and, yes. and they don't knock it out of the park or, they're, 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 again, they're afraid or, they, or they're, they'll sabotage it for some reason because they know they can't sustain this mirage. Right. Whatever it is, you are allowed to give yourself the time it takes to become excellent because you will be found. You, 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 it's not that you'll be found out. It's that you'll find your people and you'll find your tribe and they'll find you because you're just keeping the putting out in the universe. Great. Yeah, absolutely. Work. And the fact of the matter is that our struggles, our failures are actually where our biggest growth comes. There was a great book called The Talent Code by Dan, uh, Daniel Coyle. And it's awesome. Because in this book, what he's talking about is how when we practice something, we build myelin. So he, he was talking about this young girl playing the cello. Mm -hmm. And she's struggling to play this song. She gets up to a certain point and then she slows down and she's struggling to find the right notes and the right bridge and all of that. And he's, that's where the most learning is happening. And I think I know my own personal journey that I'm going to, there's stuff I'm going to do, put out to the universe and it will, it will fail. It will just not, people aren't going to like it. 
uh, it's not gonna, whatever, but that's okay. I'm building this YouTube channel, right? Some of the episodes are gonna be great, some are not so great. You've been in TV series where I think you would fully admit that there are episodes that are really great and there are episodes that you're like, Dude, I've been, I've been on, I, did, I did a show where I call, it was called Under One Roof, where I was, me and Flavor Flav, the, yeah boy, yeah. Flavor Flav played brothers. And I believe there was some magazine that called that one of the 10 worst shows <laughs> of all time. Yeah. And, and I wasn't under any illusions that I was, we were, you know, solving and curing cancer. <laughs> you were pretty sure that your name would not come up for an Emmy. We weren't, we weren't solving cancer. Yeah. We weren't getting the cure to COVID. No. We were, we were acting a fool. And we had a good time. And, and the show was what it was. And when it gets canceled, you know, call Flay, ah! And then you go on to the next, and then you go on to, you all go on to the next thing. Yeah. And in the, but in that meantime, you have met all those people. You've met the production companies. You've met yeah. the production entities. You've made people laugh in the scenes that you can make people laugh in. Yeah. You squirrel away a little money so that when there's a little downtime, you're living off one of the worst shows ever on TV history. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's all, it all can be positive depending on, on how you want to spin it. And, and, and yes, there's a million analogies of the guys who get into Hall of Fame are 300 hitters. Yeah. That, that means they hit the ball three times and fail seven. Yeah. Um, champions, the, 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 whoever's going to win the World Series or the, or the NBA championship is going to possibly lose three times, but win four times, and they're the champion. Yeah. So losing means nothing. It's this fourth one right. that puts the ring on this finger. Absolutely. And – there are people who spend their whole professional sports career never get into, never get to play in a playoff, sure. never get the ring, never, doesn't mean that they weren't successful, doesn't mean exactly. that they weren't good at what they're doing. Yeah, and, 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 and for the vast majority of people who are listening to this and whatever careers that, that they have, a championship or ultimate success isn't necessarily the end game. So you can decide what victory means for you, however you want it. And oh, you can absolutely. set the bar here. You can set the bar here. You can set the bar here. And you can consider yourself a success now. <laughs> yeah. You, you can. There's no one that is, will take that away from you. And ultimately what it is, I think something that you and I share is we are our, num our own number one fan. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I love me. I think I'm fantastic. And the way that comes across is I get on stage and I'm, I, I look confident. People have said, oh my God, that, that speech was great. Weren't you nervous? Yeah, I was a little nervous when I started, but once I started, I was in my element. I'm sure that aside from this webcam, if there's a camera and some lights on and, and a mic recording, I know that all of a sudden, Kelly just kind of, ooh, here, I, yeah, but I'm home. What? But with that means that we all have to critique ourselves as well. And we have to go, you know what? Because there's, there's, all, there's always growth. We can always grow. Oh, we absolutely. Can always, we can always incrementally get better. But saying that we are our own biggest fans, it means that even when you lose the game, mom comes up to you, gives you a hug, and takes you to Dairy Queen. Yeah. So you have to do that for yourself, even though when it's not the greatest, you have to hug yourself and take yourself to Dairy Queen or whatever it is. And then you have to look at the tape and you have to go, okay, you know what? I didn't connect these two thoughts and maybe I can put that together. Oh, ma hey, maybe this is a better bridge to this analogy than that was. And that doesn't mean that too was a, success, a failure or everything. That means that it can be, it can, it can be that much tighter. It well, can but, always but, be incrementally whatever. You know, I'll bring us back for a second and talk about stand-up comedy. I've, I, I, I did some stand-up comedy and I did the open mic nights, did that. And I, I took a comedy course. And one of the things that I learned, and I'm like, oh, that's right, which is on a given night, you, you can tell a joke and it kills one day. And the next day you go and there's crickets. Yeah. And you make that determination. Same material. You can get have you can have you can have the same material and get in and get different results. Because Absolutely. And that decision of of when to throw something out because it's just not working, is two or three times where it falls dead. Because just once, if you get up and and you 
are doing a set and you tell a joke and it just doesn't go over well, but you still know that the, the premise is good. It's funny, right? Yeah. Go try it again because it yeah. may be just the audience just wasn't in the mood for it. I, I know having done open mic nights, there were times where uh, people have been already sitting through two hours of semi-horrendous. Yeah. And yeah. even though I might get up and on a, if I'd gone first, I might have really done well, but man, they are worn out. So no matter how good my material is, I'm only going to get 25% of the reaction that I normally would get. Yeah. Yeah. And again, if you were, if, if someone was a professional comic, they would have been in those situations or they're working their way up to being able to recognize, okay, the crowd is tired and they're quiet. What do I have in the arsenal? What's in my quiver? What's back here that brings a, a crowd back to life? Is it like blue material where I say every two seconds and at least, you know, they is it a story? Is it a, you know, part of being professional in that is that you have to learn how to read the room. Oh, absolutely. And that is, and that is a professional comics job. And the only way you learn to read the room is by being in enough rooms. And that's wherein you, it goes right back to what we were saying. What is your strategy? What's your vocation? Are you planning on well, getting every it's the night? 10,000 hours. For the next 100 nights. Are you planning on doing that? Because if you're not planning on doing that, if you're only planning on getting up once a week, that means you're only getting up 52 times a year. And you're going up against people that have gone up 520 times. Yeah. And the bookers have seen them and the bookers have saw that they're good. And, and so no matter you know how tight your set is, you're not gonna get more eyeballs than the guy who went up 10 times more than you did. It's, this is just basic math. And I think that if people, again, something that can put their shoulders down is if they do the math and understand you need to put in your 10,000 hours, results will come as you start to do that. Just start clocking in your hours, man. Stop bitching that. Again, stop being a freshman bitching that they're not graduating. Right. Absolutely, Kelly. No, ab absolutely. And it is, you want to know what? No matter what you do, whatever your job is, it takes time. It takes sure. experience. It is, there isn't that overnight success. Here I am launching a, a YouTube channel and I could peel off hundred dollar bills on it. how to get a thousand subscribers and and stuff and you're right there are people who launch a channel have for whatever reason they get all these subscribers and they're super successful there is a lot of noise out there i yeah. gotta just put stuff out there and just say my audience i will find my audience and we'll build yeah. slowly that's all it is. And the people that are overnight successes, good for them. Again, we talk about Hollywood being a confluence. You hear a lot of Hollywood stories about, hey, this guy just got off the bus and a casting director saw him and he's, woo, and that brings how many more thousands? Yes, that's, that does happen. And every day somebody hits the lottery. But I have never met, and I know very few people that know somebody who has hit the lottery. So if I had a friend and who has a wife and two kids and I say to him, what's your strategy for taking care of your wife and children, putting them through school and doing that? And they go, my strategy is to hit the lottery. Yeah. I'll be like, you're, you're now you're allowed to hope that. But I say this, buy your lottery tickets on the way to work. Yeah. Your job is not to buy the lottery tickets and sit outside the liquor store until the balls drop. And see yeah. if you go, fuck. That's not your goddamn job. Your job is not to hit the lottery. Your right. job is to put in your time. Like I said, buy your lottery tickets on and, the way to work if you want, but put it, but, but put in your time. And, and even the people who quote, step off the bus and got, you know, cast as a whatever, uh, in a leading role or a major supporting role, there are those people who are just, they're that good and, and they put out a really great thing. However, by and large, you might have seen them and then you never hear from them again. Why? Possibly. Because they don't actually have the experience. They were great in that one part. Yeah. yeah. Probably because they had an awesome script and a great director and all of that that supported them to be good. I know you probably, you were talking about that show with Flav. 
I think you probably read the script and it's like, this is not the best script in the world, but hey, you want to know what? You still had the Benjis at the end of the day. So yeah. Yeah, and I had and I had the opportunity to to make the best of it and to and to find the funny in it. And I also had the opportunity to be a series regular on a show. So that means when I get my next show, my quote for how much I get for a show is that much higher. Absolutely. So, so there's nothing you know, there's, negative. And there's more for your reel to show sure. that what you've done. So. <laughs> Yeah. So again, a lot, a lot of times I, I talk about like a body in, these are laws of physics. A body in motion tends to stay in motion. Yeah. So do that. Put in your, put in your eight hours a day. I don't think I, you know, have any philosophies that are brand new to Kelly Perrine. I've just adopted some of the philosophies that are out there and actually put them in, into play. I don't think, I don't think in 2020 people don't know how to say lose weight if they want. They just don't want to do it. <laughs> yeah, no. I, 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 there's, there's no new trick, new pill, new something. To, they kind of just don't want to do it. <laughs> you know? Exactly. No, there, there, there's no doubt about that. That it's honestly the formula isn't that hard. No, it's not. Less but, in than than going out and. Yeah. Yes, yes. I, I, you may not know it looking at me, but I'm a, I'm a marathon runner. <laughs> I, I, I did know that because I was a marathon runner. And so the thing is this, the thing is this, I, I have always, with my philosophies and my work, I've always loved the metaphor of the marathon. It's a marathon, not a sprint. And so I remember when I was about 33, I said, you know what? I'm going to run a marathon so that when I use that metaphor, I can actually use it with some type of knowledge of what an actual physical marathon was so i trained for six months i went and did through aids project los angeles so i raised money for aids awareness yeah um i lost some weight they travel you over to honolulu so i'm like this is a win situation yeah. and i go you know, i will cross it me off of my life's list of things to do and so i remember i was at mile 24 yeah and i was at four hours and 50 four hours and 40 minutes and i told myself i wanted to get in under five hours. Sure. So I, so I had two miles to go after already running 24. So I said, God, if you get me in under five, I will never <laughs> do another one of these again. And so I picked it up and I got in at four hours and 58 minutes. Woohoo! Took, took my shoes, threw them into the water, <laughs> took my little sports watch, threw it out, said never again. And then about a month later, I'm like, I was looking at the medal. I'm like, huh, that was, that's pretty cool. You know what, LA Marathon's coming up. So I, I've now run 19 marathons. I don't win them. No, of course not. But it's about discipline. I like having something on the calendar that I have to work towards. Absolutely. I've talked in prior episodes a lot about my marathoning and how, how much it is, every marathon's its own epic journey. And the how like i i talked about how i break down mentally doing a marathon which is first goal is to make it to 13.1 because now i i'm halfway done then it's 17 because then you have single digits left then you get to mile 20 and hey i only got a 10k left and if i made it this far and then yeah. you get and then you, you get to count it down now one of the things I know they got to do it, but man, I wish they wouldn't put the mile signs up until about mile five, because nothing, as much as you try and not say whatever, mile two, you got 24 more. Yeah, it's not, yeah. And it is just it be mentally debilitating because you're like, I'm not thinking about it. You're, part of your brain's going, yeah, you got 24 left. That's a long way. Yeah, you know, and here's a funny thing about how, how I trained for a marathon. I did a thing, I forget the, the, the guy's name, but we did, I had a watch that I would run for six minutes and then it would beep. Yep. And then I would walk for a minute. Yep. So six minutes into the marathon, my watch goes off and I start uh -huh. walking. Yep. Six minutes into the marathon. And so people are walking by go, what are you doing? Run, get out of here. What are, come on, sit down there. And so every six minutes and 14 hours in, there's people on the side going, what are you walking for? What are you walking for? But they didn't know what I was doing. They didn't know my pace. 
They didn't know my strategy. Absolutely. They didn't know my plan. I passed by them in five seconds and I waved to them, but I wasn't gonna let their not knowing what my goal was, what my preparation was, well, what my plan was, how I was going to come in five hours and how doing it that way pushes back the, the wall that a lot of people inevitably hit. And they didn't know I trained for six days. That's all right, let them, so the people that are in your life that are trying to tell you to get off your pace and to get off your plan and to do whatever you want, you gotta just wave to them because they will pass you by as you keep walking. And I also say, because I've done a number of marathons where it hurt, but I go, you can cry, but do it while you're moving forward. <laughs> well, absolutely. Look, uh, Kelly, ab absolutely. And I haven't done, I've only done four. And <laughs> oh, that's four more I'll, than 99% of the I know. And 11 halves, I was lucky enough to, to get to run Boston in 2014. And that was unbelievable, beyond epic. I was so, yeah, so yeah. oh, was that bucket list? And I'm like, no, that was holy grail moment. Let me tell you, <laughs> when I crossed the, the finish line there, crying like a baby. Why? Because yeah. it's something that I had dreamt of and all those 5 a.m. mornings in the cold and the rain and, and all of that as I was training was so worth it because right. I can say, for the rest of my life, I am a Boston Marathon finisher. Yeah, yeah you do that. a so, marathon runner, you know what yeah, I mean? So, so, so you do that, and we do our thing. And there's, so there's really nothing that somebody can say, you know what, Kelly Alexander, you, you can't do that. There's nobody that can look me in the face and do that, and I, and I believe them. <laughs> there's, there's, I know. There's, there's nothing. There's nobody that can tell me if I don't. I might look. I might not play in the NBA, but I wouldn't say that's my dream. <laughs> Absolutely. So no, I look, I totally get you. And there is, that's one of the things that's great about marathoning. As long as you cover the distance, you get a medal. You get a medal. And you should. I was talking to someone who goes, oh, I think it's wrong. I think they should only give it to first, second, and third. I'm like, okay, you go cover 26.2 miles and you tell me whether you feel that you don't deserve some yeah, and, and anecdotally, how are they doing in their life? I'm sure they're first, second, and third in everything in their life. Yeah, I'm yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. Hey, Kelly, this has been absolutely epic to talk to you. Thank you well, for you taking know what? the time. Yeah, hey, man, you, you know what? You, you, thank you for thinking of me because I, I can't lie to you. I, I love what I do. I've been doing it, like I said, I train for it. And so I feel blessed every day that I'm able to make a living in the vocation that I chose. Some days is tough, some days is hard, but I, there are very few days that I go, I shouldn't have chosen this. What am I doing here? I got to quit. There, there, there are hardly ever, if any, days like that. There are some days where I go, I got to get through this, or I just got to get to the other side of it, or when is that one minute break coming? <laughs> yeah. But uh, again, just one, one foot in front of the other. The whole idea of being epic, we didn't really necessarily start off to be epic, but the fact that we're here and we're, we're keep striving, that in and of itself is part of the epic journey that we are on. Absolutely. And, and I, I, I think that epic is, sometimes it is a decision. You, we both made that epic decision to run a marathon, okay? Yeah that decision is obviously quite epic but then when you're doing your life's work other people may say oh that's epic and look at how successful they are and stuff i don't view it i just view it as this is what i am meant to do and so i'm gonna do it the best i can and see look i, I look I'm, i i don't have kids so when somebody, when I see somebody with kids and they're like raising three of them and they're homeschooling them now and they're doing this and they're distance learning and they're doing, I, I'm, I'm like, God, Sam, you're a superhuman. <laughs> that, that seems epic to me, man. I'm like, good Lord, how do, how do they do it? And they're like, ah, what do you mean? It's what, what do you mean, how do I do it? I, I have to do it. This is what I do. This is what I do. And they don't really see it as anything. And I'm like mind blown as how they have the juggling ability. They got to cook the food and they got to do this. And they got to get the kid on Zoom. They got to do this. We have to do this. I'm like, that's just epic. So in our own lives, we all have epic ability, all that. We should all look at ourselves in the mirror and kind of pat ourselves on the backs, say we're doing all right, getting good grades, future so bright, we got to wear shades. We're doing all right. <laughs> Absolutely. And we should all, I want to encourage everyone out there, you should be your number one fan. 
you don't love you, how's anyone else gonna love you? And we are all, we are all fantastic. Yeah. And, and I'm, I'm gonna end with a quote from Mr. Rogers. <laughs> some are fancy on the inside, some are fancy on the outside. Everyone's fancy, everyone's special. I am fancy and so are you. Fred Rogers, man, totally nailed that. I, I can't top that. So with that, I say thank you for thinking of me, Zan. No problem. Thank you, Callie. All right.